Good morning. Welcome to worship. Welcome to Christ the King Sunday. This is the Sunday, one Sunday throughout the year, where we really focus on Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. So we're going to invite you to stand. Let's worship. Let's sing out together. We're going to sing to the King. Let's sing out.
single day of your life I'm the whisper inside that won't let you forget Hello, my name is Evie I know you recognize me Just when you think you can win I'll drag you right back down again Till you lost all But you have a seat. There we go. <laughs> Christ the King Sunday. We're going to talk about that here momentarily. Looking forward to it. Uh, okay, housekeeping. Food challenge for the week is rice and beans. So if you're out in the neck of the woods where you can pick up some boxes here and there, that's our food challenge for the food closet this week. Rice and beans. It's really been a tremendous um, outpouring that we've done for each weekly challenge has been amazing. So continue that up. This is the season. Uh, just to mention, the Good Timers Christmas party was in a couple of spots was, was uh, originally set for like the 2nd of December, and it's actually for the 9th. So if you're planning on going to that, make sure you go on the 9th and not on the 2nd to Venetian Palace from 1 to 4. Uh, men's breakfast is also coming up. If you would like to attend, we'd love you to come, uh, bring family, that kind of stuff. It's going to be from 8 to 10 on the 8th of December, which is a Saturday morning. Uh, please let myself or really even Tom Reed or Bill Schaefer know if you're planning on coming. We're going to start buying some food. Right now we have four guys that are coming, and I think there'll be more than that. But <laughs> we, we want to make sure we don't just have food for four and 25 show up. So regardless, um, please come to that. It'll be a fantastic thing for us to do. Um, there are still, for those who were here yesterday, it was an amazing thing to see just the traffic flow and a lot of good stuff going on with the Christmas Bazaar. So Mickey, wonderful job uh, organizing, putting that together. One of the perks, yes, absolutely. You may have noticed a new nativity. Uh, one of the perks or one of the, the blessings that we got out of that last year, if I'm remembering correctly, was or this year too, is uh, we now have a nativity that's fantastic that we're going to lift up to that. So that came from the, the proceeds of that. But there are still some wreaths out there. If you saw them hanging on the door, those are all for sale. Uh, we've got a few other plants and those kind of things. So we'll be glad to, to do that if there's a few things left over still. 
All right. Roll that video. No, Stewardship Month is still going on, and we do have a stewardship video that we're going to show um, about uh, the mission trips that we do to El Jute, so we're going to watch that very quickly and finish up our Stewardship Month. Thank you so much for your support of the partnership we have with Hope of Life and World Help to adopt a village in need in Guatemala. The original plans for El Jute called for clean water, educational improvements, the presentation of the gospel, and future sustainment. The school children and their families always tell us how much they appreciate what God has done for them through our congregation. Since 2016, we have traveled to our village three times to implement those plans. All of our trips have relationship building as well as Bible school. In April 2017, we funded a water project and we gave each family a blessing bag and a Spanish Bible. In September 2017, we built a playground and new bathrooms for the school. Our third trip was this past June 2018, and we were able to bless the villagers with school repairs. We also completely revamped their largest classroom with new steps, a new floor, stucco, and paint. Leftover funds also provided a brand new security fence, as well as new whiteboards and desks for the classrooms. Our next team will leave on January 12th, and we have a God-sized week planned. We will hold Bible school, do home visits, and provide a food bag for each family that will feed them for three weeks. The biggest undertaking for the January trip will be a wellness clinic for the villagers where we will do basic checkups, care for any open wounds, provide reading glasses if needed, and give out over-the-counter medicines to each family. With the generosity of our congregation, we have already raised the money for the food bags and the reading glasses have been donated. However, we are still in need of some medical supplies to take with us for the clinic. A complete list will be given in the next few weeks' bulletins. The list includes basic items like Tylenol and Motrin, as well as Band-Aids, antibacterial soap, vitamins, and other similar items. Would you like to help provide medical supplies, or would you like to go on our June trip to build a church and a pastor's home? Contact Mike or Lori Hinman as soon as possible if you are interested in either of these outreach efforts. Again, thank you so much for your support of this project. The kids and their families are becoming like family to us, and it's our privilege to share the gospel with them. I wanted to say, nice job, Lori. You notice how they strategically put those little big brown eyes right at the end. It's like, oh, in a little baby hole. Okay. Um, tear, you know, pull at your heartstrings. Um, but no, we do still have, want to lift up our, our stewardship. This is one of the things that we do as, as a stewardship team as well. So that is our month that we're going on. Um, so if you're visiting, you can see we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, we're in week two, kind of, of our stewardship, holistic stewardship approach. So how many of you brought your pledge cards back? Not going to, okay, good, a few. Um, I'm back there in the back, there are red buckets. Um, they are going to be just simply you toss them on your way out. If you didn't bring them back this week, we have more out there because uh, next week's kind of the big one. We'll, we'll walk through that here in just a little bit. We're going to go through some of the budget pieces and, and hopefully get, get some of the pledges. But if you're visiting, that's not an expectation, <laughs> just so you know. You're not here to, to, to do all that. We want you to be a part of just coming into worship with us. So, All right, that is what I have in the way of announcements. Anybody else got anything quick? Scanning. Good. All right, well, yes, as Ryan mentioned, it is Christ the King Sunday, so we're going to stand. We'll begin with confession, and uh, we'll begin worship then. We begin our worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess your sin our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. We take a moment of silence. Having prepared our hearts, we confess. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. 
we are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It was in the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us. And for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority alone, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Oh no, crap. Psych. <laughs> Gotta get it a little quicker. All right, the peace of the Lord be with you always. <laughs> now let's share God's peace with one another. <laughs> As you work your way back to your seats, you may remain standing for our two scripture readings. The first of which comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting with the ninth verse. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of this service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. This is the word of the Lord. And our gospel comes from John, the 18th chapter, starting with the 33rd verse. Pilate went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. So you are a king, asked Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. 
Well, grace, peace, and love to you from the one who loved us enough to die for us, Jesus, our King and our Lord. Amen. So good morning again. Everyone have a good Thanksgiving time? Yes? Good. Awesome. It's good to be with friends and family at those times if you're able to. Um, perhaps you picked up on it because Ryan mentioned it, but so did we, but this is Christ the King Sunday. All right. This is the day that we celebrate in our church traditions, um, Christ being our King. All right. Now, Along with this, it's also, as alluded to, also the second Sunday that we're talking about holistic stewardship and intentionally looking at a sacrificial stewardship approach when it comes to our lives. Um, And so last week we talked about, on purpose, who has the control of the things in our life, who really controls us, and most of all, we looked at how our finances can actually control us. So we have an annual meeting coming up on Monday, December 10th. Of course, you're all encouraged to be there. Because we're going to be adopting the working budget, if you will, for the next fiscal year. Uh, So we're looking at our, intentionally looking these first couple of weeks at our approach to how we look at our finances from a holistic stewardship personally and, of course, corporately, what benefits can come from that together as a church community. And so I shared with you a little bit about my personal approach and how I try to look at uh, holistic stewardship and involve that in everything we do into our giving to the church and to God. So with that little bit of backdrop... Here's what we're going to do this week. We are also still going to talk a little bit more about corporate giving, um, how that leads us to our budget, and then how that will be adopted then on December 10th at 7 o'clock on Monday. And we're going to look at that in the context of 2 Corinthians 9, which Greg read for us, with the overarching theme of Christ the King influencing how we approach things. And we're going to try and do it in 20 to 25 minutes. (laughs) Yay! All right. So first, let's talk kings, monarchs, and royalty. Um, If you've noticed, we've actually been using the term all in lately. Have you heard that one a few times over the last couple months? All in for the kingdom of God. Now, this is not a brilliant marketing program or any kind of a slogan to brand our lifestyles, but it's simply to encourage us and to remind us that what we do on a day-to-day basis is important. And is it what we do on that day-to-day basis showing forth God's glory and showing forth the gospel? So are we all in in our lives for God and his kingdom? And so we've taken this approach to our lives as a way to look at them intentionally, giving them to God 24 hours a day, seven, hours, seven days a week. And so that's how we're talking about our discipleship through Christ, all right? Because if we have to frame it in a way, really, that we can all buy into, and this is a pretty easy way to understand that if we're all in for God, this is what it kind of looks like. Because God is in control, and we aren't. And so, once again, then, we also are lifting up this Sunday as Christ the King Sunday, The one Sunday a year, as Ryan mentioned, that we do celebrate Christ the King in our lives. We sing the appropriate hymns and the worship songs. We pray the prayers to our King. But I have to tell you, I'm openly sharing with you, that this weekend feels completely disconnected from the rest of the year for me. And probably for anyone who really lives in the Western world. Because we don't know what it's like to have a King. We've never had to deal with it. And the fact that we only celebrate Christ the King once a year shows us that we really have no idea what it means to have a king intentionally rule our lives. All right? So what would it really mean if we had a king? It would mean that we would be subject to the complete rule of all that we have, including our families, our homes, our properties, our wealth, anything else you can imagine that we say we have control of. All right? And at any given time, our king could ask for any of it or all of it back, and we would have no choice but to give it up. That's what it means to live in a king, in kingship. Um, if we were ruled by a king, we would ultimately have absolutely no possessions for ourselves, but they would actually belong to the kingdom itself, and we get to use them. Um, if we were subjects of a king, we would have no loyalty other to, other to other, anyone other than the kingdom itself and the king who is ruling that kingdom. Um, we'd have to abide by the laws of that ruler. And so we hear throughout the, the, the years about these stories of good kings and bad kings, and, and we have no idea, though, what it would mean to live in a kingship or in a monarchy, to live through a period of time where nothing we ever had belonged to us. And so this is why Christ the King sometimes in many cases can be disconnected and almost be a detriment, a negative for those of us who are living in the Western world, but mostly in the United States. Our forefathers, our families immigrated to this country because they were tired of the tyranny of kingships. It's what we based our entire social existence on in this country. It's what we fought a revolutionary war against. It sprouted this country against an English monarchy in the 1700s. We come from a people 
who do not want to be ruled or taxed and under the complete control of a king. So why then would we celebrate Christ the King Sunday or Christ the King as our king when we revolt at the very concept of having a king to begin with? See how it kind of feels disconnected? Now, most of us probably think that Christ the King Sunday is this quaint little service that we do once a year that can give Jesus his authority. But if he's really our king, it would be a lot more than just one Sunday a year. It would be a year-long relationship. It would be a lifelong relationship, one that we would truly have to change some things in our lives to really show that we have a king. And so I'm torn, and I've always been torn about this Sunday. See, Christ as king has never fully connected me to where I would really like to be for God's kingdom. Um, Because as long as we have a choice, as long as I have a choice, I get to choose. And we do give thanks for the choices in our lives. But as long as I'm the one or we are the ones holding control over the things in our lives, then we'll never fully be able to embrace Christ as our king and what that really means. So what do we do about that? Right? Get rid of Christ the King Sunday? No. It's part of our tradition. Part of our, we truly do love this Sunday. Do we quit talking about Jesus as our king? No. Jesus is our king. But what we can do is honestly confess that we don't fully understand and fully know what it's like to give complete and utter control of our lives over to someone or anyone. But we can continue to honestly strive to continue to be all in for Jesus and be all in for God's kingdom. We can be intentional about our theological approaches to find ways to look at all that we are and all that we have as belonging to God and our king, and then actually believe it and start acting like we believe it. And that's what we call now stewardship. Right? So it's really good God stuff how it works together. Um, so just a refresher, stewardship, holistic stewardship is this. Acknowledging that all we are and all that we have has been given to us by God to be used for his glory. Kind of like a king, right? Nothing is ours. Nothing we've worked for, lived for, given birth to. There is nothing in our lives that has not had the hand of God's providence upon it. And so we're to use these gifts that have been given to us to show forth the glory of God and not the glory of ourselves. And this isn't, shouldn't be a once-a-year celebration. This is an all-year, all-inclusive, everyday, complete lifestyle kind of king. This is what it really means to have a king or a monarch rule over us. And honestly, Jesus Christ is the only one we ever want to rule over our lives because we've seen what happens when humanity gets involved in a little bit of control. Right? Heard of Adam and Eve? <laughs> so, so we're going to continue this week then and next week to finalize this approach to our holistic stewardship. And we're going to look at it intentionally from a fiscal standpoint, if you will. And we're going to look at how this holistic approach, stewardship approach, means in our worship community. Last week, we talked a little more individually approaching. All right? We looked at personal sacrifice as the key to understanding how we give back to God. We read in 2 Corinthians that God loves a cheerful giver. And we are to decide in our own hearts, with our own families, our own spouses, what we decide to give back to God. And if it's a sacrifice, then it's at the heart of worship. And it's a true expression that we are giving back to God those things that control us. And so we pledge that to God. And that's why we still are using these pledge cards, because we do have to do our own kind of personal stewardship. But then we're also going to get into what that's going to do corporately together. So again, red buckets, if you didn't bring it this week, next week's the big week. Um, Now, in 2 Corinthians 9, there is also verse 8. And I want to be very deliberate and very careful with these following verses, this following verse, because the approach that it can actually lead us to. It reads this, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things and at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Here's a tricky phrase in, out of that reading. God is able to bless you abundantly. You may have heard of a few pastors out there these days. These are all pastors who have dabbled in, or cross the line when it comes to what we call, in our world, the prosperity gospel. You heard of that term? Uh, It's what Martin Luther called the theology of glory. And what's different about this is we subscribe to, in a Lutheran tradition, the theology of the cross, where everything we do goes through the cross in order to get to the resurrection on the other side. Very, Very simplifying. The theology of glory basically does the reverse. You live in all the blessings, but you forget that you had to go through the cross to get it. So we'll explain that in just a minute. But... 
This theology, this uh, prosperity gospel theology is that name it and claim it kind of faith. Um, It's the approach to our faith that says if you do this in God's name, God's going to do this for you. Uh, If you pray the right way, God will reward you. If you make a sacrifice to God, he will multiply it for your good. God will make you wealthy if you live your life in this way or that way. All right, so this is not what verse 8 is promoting. All right, we are not giving to God so that he's going to bless us abundantly. It can. <laughs> he can do that. But that's not what we're asking for. All right? We are giving to God out of our gratitude, out of sacrifice, cheerfully, and that actually allows us to approach our lives differently. That's what Christians have different than the rest of the world. We approach our lives as that whatever gifts we have have been given to us by God, no matter how big or how small, and that is all we need. All right? That's what we call abundance in this case. So it's really all about the orientation of our heart and where we see things. But this approach, this gospel prosperity approach, really kind of makes me sad. Um, I'm not going to go railing against it. Uh, it's not very Christian-like either. <laughs> but what I can do is share with you how this kind of thinking can really be detrimental to our faith. Uh, the name it and claim it approach, or the do this and get that approach to being a Christian, is like playing the Jesus lottery. All right? It puts a lot of the pressure on our works and our skills and our luck, and doesn't allow God's will to be done at all times. I'm going to give you an example. Um, as part of the process to become an ordained pastor um, in the previous ELCA, I sh- don't think we're doing that in the NALC currently, but we walked through what was called a CPE, a clinical pastoral experience. It was about a four to six month program where you get to be a chaplain and it, you have to learn how to walk with people. And so I was honored actually to walk with folks during um, this piece and I was in a step down unit at a heart hospital. And so before surgery, after surgery, in surgery, I had somebody ask me to walk in them with her. Um, But we got to provide glimpses of Jesus in those moments for those folks. And it was really a humbling experience to walk through people in those times. Um, But occasionally I would find myself in the chapel. So sometimes I would be sitting, praying. Other times I would be reflecting. But if there happened to be someone in the chapel already there, we were encouraged to go up and ask if we could just sit with them or pray with them, right? And so one afternoon, I came across a woman who was, who was in there. She was praying, but she was crying as well. And so I asked her if I could pray with her. And she said, that's fine, but it doesn't really matter. God doesn't answer prayers. Woo, time to work, <laughs> right? Yeah. So I asked her if we'd be willing to share, and of course she did. And so she had just lost her husband. She'd been, he'd been sick for a little while, and she really thought he was going to get better. But he found himself having a little bit of surgery and then didn't make it through. And she was very, very mad, of course, as we all would be. But I asked her to continue to share, encouraging her. And that's when I got a glimpse of how pervasive this um, prosperity gospel can really be. And this was 11 years ago, um, how, how it can really devastate someone's faith. She shared with me that her pastor gave her some prayers to say. And there's some prayers for healing, some prayers for trust. And that would be a normal thing, you would think, right? But he said that if she trusted God and she believed in God and prayed strongly and prayed and claimed the power of Jesus Christ in his name in this prayer, then her husband would be fine and he would be healed. All right? He wasn't. He died. So then what does that do to her and her faith? Well, it devastated her. It devastated her faith. And she felt like a failure now. She said, and I quote, I must not have prayed enough. I must have done it wrong, or my husband would still be here. I mean, my friends, we don't pray every day when we say the Lord's Prayer, or we do pray, thy will be done, right? We do not pray. Jesus didn't teach us to pray that if we pray hard enough, good things are going to happen for us. God is not a vending machine. It's not how this works, necessarily. (laughs) Um, This is God's work. God has the ability to do all these things, but this is not what what it really is designed for. And I hope this is kind of coming through clearly because I know this can be convoluted at times. But for prosperity-driven people, the abundance of wealth or glory is the goal. And it's achieved by our own works, right? Yes, there are biblical examples of people of faith who have been blessed by God with wealth. All right, Solomon, Abraham, others. But there are also passages like this one in 2 Corinthians that can be used as an example of what abundant prosperity is available to us if we do trust in God and proclaim his gospel. Right? But that's not why we proclaim. Wealth is not the goal here. Even if we attach Jesus' name to it, 
And I know that may not sit well with everyone, but the gospel is about saving souls, not our wallets. So hopefully that didn't come across as a rant, right? <laughs> no, hopefully. Um, because the prosperity gospel out there is really one of the biggest disparagers of discipleship. And that's what we are up against, even in our own Christian circles, having conversations about authentic Christianity. Because when the goal becomes self-improvement and not self-humility and service, then discipleship can't be the focus. When faith focuses on us and not on Jesus, it's a setup for devastation. When there are expectations of wealth by healing or by praying or living in a certain way, and they don't come true, then what are you left with? All right? A broken faith and a lot of guilt in many cases, that somehow this is my fault. I didn't do it the right way. And that really just breaks my heart, uh, because that's not what we're all about. The only growth that we are seeking is discipleship growth, and a growth in our faith for the one who has given us everything to begin with. And when we do that together as a worship community, great things will happen. Amazing things can come from this. There is an abundance that will come from that. But it's the holistic stewardship approach that, that works. It's the service approach, a sacrificial approach to our things. Not so we can grow our wealth, but we grow our faith. And yes, God is able to, to bless us abundantly, but it doesn't mean he necessarily will. All right. And so I'm going to kind of switch gears because I could keep going. Um, but if anyone really wants to talk about it and find ways to help have these conversations out in the world, because it's out there, uh, please, please talk to me about it. We'll be glad to do that. But we want to talk back now, holistic con or congregational stewardship. Why we do what we do the way we do it. Um, the fun part about the messy business of churches is balance. You've heard that word, balance? I think that was one of the first things I talked about early on. Um, the balance between us and them, so to speak. Us in here and them out there. Um, as a worship community driven by the love of God and the mission to connect to each other and to God, we have to find a balance here. Uh, what we can do in our own spaces to help build each other up and lift each other up and grow in our own faith and discipleship so that we can then take that and go out beyond the walls and, explain, and, and share that with others. And that's what verse 12 and 13 is really about in 2 Corinthians 9. Um, it reads, the service you perform, and of course Paul is talking about actually financial giving at this piece, but he says, the service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. That's us. Uh, because of the service in which you've proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession with the gospel of Jesus Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. There are be tangible benefits, faith and action, to what we do in our financial giving. And so this corporate approach lifts up the benefits of what a group of people that love God and share their own gifts through their service can do. And don't ever underestimate the power of what generosity can do in, in the lives of other people. All right? We may never hear about it, but it's happening. It's not about us anyway. But we know that we are immersed, though, in a world that is simply looking for results, right? We are a results-oriented people. Many times we won't give to a group or to a charity unless we can directly see the benefits of what we're doing and where our support is going. Churches are no different. We like to think we are, but we're no different. All right? We still like to see where our money is going. We still want to see what we can really do with it and what we're doing for the good of others. And, and next week, as we will look very intentionally at the budget, we will also be able to see where much of our money is going and what it is being used for. And we're going to be very open about it. Um, because here, about 20 years ago, there was a trend that was going on. Churches began to adopt a different term for their budgets. And I'm not sure if, it's happened, if it did happen here or not, but they began to call their budgets ministry plans. You ever heard that term? Ministry plans, if you were in, walking in those circles. The budget of your church is a ministry plan. And what that meant, the spirit of this change was to try and lay out before the congregation what the ministries that they're being a part of. Because people will give to ministries, we know that. They like to see the results of what's happening, right? So we try and get them to buy in a little more fully to the budget because of the ministry focus, right? Here's why, in my humble opinion, I don't think it worked very well. Churches began to present their budgets more openly and more fully as far as uh, being exposed to what everything was there. But because most of the churches were smaller and medium-sized, they found out what they were really highlighting was the pastoral salaries and the facility costs. 
and they were upwards of 75 to 90 percent of the entire budget. And so the ministries were, in many cases, only 10 to 20 percent of the budgets. That may be the case here, too. I'm not sure. We haven't completely dug into that yet. But this, in my approach, this approach, in my opinion, was really kind of backfiring on congregations, right? Because while they understand that we need pastors and we need facilities, people rarely get motivated about just paying the bills, right? And so nothing really kind of changed through this ministry plan approach. Um, but what will change then? Well, as pastors, we're called to leadership. And I learned long ago that you're only as successful as the people you surround yourself with. And the reason this is important in any congregation is look at the people we're surrounded with. Amazing, faith-filled people, right? People that have been given passions and gifts from God himself. And so we as leaders have to stop trying to find ways to outthink our folks and just get to to the heart of what matters. Lifting up our faith, lifting up our gifts, our skills, and working together for Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about to begin with. So this means that if we have to simply go and talk about the finances of our church, then we just have direct conversations about the finances of our church, uh, the budget, all those kind of pieces, right? We have to talk about the vision, right? Where we're going, where we want to be, and be honest with ourselves with what we're looking at and allow ourselves to use the gifts that are currently with us and the people that work together to use those gifts. Because at some point, pastors got the idea that we have to try fancy programs and try and outthink the people in the pews. And that might have had its time, but folks, I'm not smart enough to do that. <laughs> I don't have the energy to try and outthink y'all. I really don't. But I want to do this together anyway, so I wouldn't even try and do that. So that's where we want to put our focus and our energy in the things that actually are going to unite us and bring us together and lead us to proclaim that gospel forward. It's for the growth of the gospel and the growth of our faith. We lead by example. But it's simple basics. We're going to start with God. Start with discipleship. Start with service. Three big pieces. Those are the ministries that we are talking about. right? We keep God's vision in front of us, and we lift up the stories of ministry that keep us understanding that what we do in God's kingdom is important because we are changing lives. But this is really what this is. It's church. This is being the church, right? helping to bring in the kingdom of God to a world that doesn't want to be ruled. And we got to leg up because we understand what that means. And so next week we will look at the breakdown and see where our finances are actually being distributed. We'll look at the operational pieces and the ministry pieces. And if it feels out of whack, we figure out a way how to make them feel right. We look at the trends. We look at the visions. And all of this is to say that we're going to look at where we are and where we want to be. And it doesn't take anything other than an understanding of this. When we give what we have chosen to give, personally, family-wise, God is going to use that. And we will be enriched and blessed, and the prayers and the hearts of those people that we affect in the name of Jesus Christ will simply be amazing. So yes, our budget is a theological statement. All right? It will tell us where our priorities are. It will tell us what we find most important right here and right now. But it's only a tool. It's a tool to look at where we are, and that's it. If we want to change the vision to one of more ministry focus, less facility focus, then we lay out a plan to do so. And then we look at our budget as a tool, kind of a report card, to keep us on track of where we want to be. If we want to reduce our debt, we have debt. Then we make that a goal, and we ask God to help us get there. Budgets are only theological report cards. It tells us what's most important to us because that's where we're putting our most energy and the most money to. And if we only look at our progress once a year on stewardship weekends, then it's not going to be as effective as if we look at it routinely, more of a lifestyle. So especially if we're all in for God's kingdom every day of every week, that's what we got to focus on. So the fact that we have an opportunity to continue to look at aspects of our financial giving and our budgets for the church shows us again that we really have no idea what it's like to be subject to a king. Ultimately, we still get to pick and choose where we want our money to go. And there are still those of us who would like to see the benefits of where our money is going. And so we would encourage you to be active participants in this. And I would encourage you to ask questions, to be involved. All right? Because this all involves holistic stewardship. 
when we have the understanding that everything we are and everything we have comes from God, then we do inch closer and closer to understanding what it really means to have Jesus as our king. And what we do is only to serve him. Christ the king is not just a Sunday. If we believe Christ is our king, then we give thanks every day that he died on that cross and that he rose from that grave and allows us to have the honor to be all in and to live in his eternal kingdom forevermore. That's what we give thanks to Christ our king today and every day. Amen. I invite you to stand as we pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, though it is confusing, we do lift you up as our King. Help us to to fully understand what that means to have someone in our life who cares for us, who looks after us, who provides all that we need. Help us to be faithful servants of you, faithful stewards of those gifts that you have given us. Help us to create a whole approach to our lives so that we not only offer pieces that we have control over, but our entire life to you. Be with us this week as we've given thanks for those who we've spent family and friends with, time we've spent together, the things that we will be doing going forward to show forth your kingdom. All this we ask in your son Jesus' name, our King. Amen.
Now with the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, for those in need, and all of God's creation. Heavenly Father, you gave the people of this world as the inheritance of your only Son, Jesus Christ. You crowned him as King of kings and Lord of lords, and you set him at your right hand to rule over all creation. You gave him your church to be his bride. As we celebrate Christ the King Sunday, let us come in humility and in worship. In our hearts, may he be priest, hearing our confessions and our prayers. In our minds, may our thoughts be taken captive to be obedient to him. In our lives, may our actions reflect his transforming light so that it may shine forth and bring you glory. King of heaven, your word tells us that blessed is the nation whose God is Lord. We know that no authority exists except that which you have established. In your sovereign wisdom, we lift up the leaders of this nation and the leaders of all nations. May the kings of this world bend their knee to the king of all, and may they lead with wisdom, with integrity. May they show the same concern for those whom they govern as you have for all of your people. Holy God, we thank you for your continued care and provision, for your protection, for all your people. We especially ask that you would be with our servicemen and women, our first responders, all of our public servants and our protectors. Keep them safe in the line of duty and bring them safely home to their families and loved ones. And Father, again, we lift up the families of all of your saints whom you have called home to be with you. We pray that you would comfort their loved ones with the consolation of the hope that we share in Christ's resurrection power. We ask again for you to be with the family of John Walter, whose service of resurrection will be held here tomorrow. Be with Cheryl and all those who grieve, and grant them your peace. Now, Lord, we pray for all those who are here among us in our congregation, if not physically, then in spirit, who are in need of your healing presence. We lift up by name Richard Hisley and Richard Carter. We pray for Bob Bischoff and Roy Krebs, for Lynn Hostetler, Claiborne Norris, and Chris Dean. We pray for Kathleen Causey and Dwayne Parker, for Doyle Homan, Kim Kelly, Arlene Boyd, Pat Saunders and Mark Franker, Del Birch, Norma Austin, Angie Jackson, and all those whose names we now mention either silently or out loud before you. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, the King of kings, in whose name we pray. Amen. Your friends, it was in the night in which he was betrayed. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ took bread. He gave thanks and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink. And he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let's remember by praying the prayer our Lord and Savior taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The feast is ready. Please come and eat. I invite you to be seated.
Now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen us all and keep us forever in his grace. Amen. Amen. Now may the Lord bless us and keep us this day. May the Lord's face shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord look upon us with his favor and give us all his peace. Amen.
Before we go, I've been uh, asked to remind you that the tickets for It's a Wonderful Life are on sale at the, chil at the uh, children's and youth counter in the narthex. And um, have a wonderful week in the Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks for watching. Trinity Evangelical Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland and at trinityjoppa.org. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat. Be sure to check out the Facebook page for our Trinity Joppa YouTube channel, and please consider supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash trinityjoppa. God bless.